Rejoice, rejoice, give thanks, and sing. Though life's path is long, and where was the other line? And, <laughs> and youth to age by night and day, in gladness and in woe, in this life we have much to rejoice about. Amen? Amen. And that is what we do in this service when we come together, is in the midst of our week, in the midst of all the things that we have had to deal with, we come together taking this opportunity as a family to rejoice and to give thanks and to sing. Our service begins on page two of your bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and blessed, blessed be, his be his kingdom, kingdom now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. with you and also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now let us attend our hearts to the readings to the God the reading of God's most holy word. The first reading comes from Jonah chapter 3. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said that he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishment. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. 
so that Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when the dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down upon the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor, in which you did not grow. It, be it came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 1. To me, living in Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two, my desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Jesus Christ when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, 
I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear me, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Lord Christ. To me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. Um, I I don't know if I've already told you about my father. Something tells me I have. I think I've brought him up in the past, but um, it's relevant this morning. I grew up in a complicated home. Uh, My mom was a Christian. My dad wasn't. Uh, My dad had been beaten up by life early on. He just never really recovered. And consequently, he was an angry man for most of my life. And over the years, he had heard the gospel, but he was one of those people who thought he had made a deal with God. And so despite the fact that his whole family went to church, Um, he didn't need Jesus, and he wasn't really too worried about it. Until at around 67, my dad faced multiple bypass surgery. And as he waited for the surgery, one of the pastors of my mom's church, Doug Davis, went to see my dad and led him to the Lord. 
And we, our whole family was shocked. I, I mean, I didn't really believe it. I had already moved away. And I, I just, I, I didn't know what to think about this. And I couldn't wait to get back home after the surgery and see my dad. And all I can say is that my dad was transformed. I mean, he had been funda- fundamentally changed. He went from a recluse to being like one of the most social people in my family. Um, he couldn't wait for church. Every time the door was open, he wanted to be there. And he spent the next year and a half before he passed away, he spent almost every single day listening to the Bible on tape for just hours on end. He went from someone who was almost never happy to someone who couldn't get enough out of life. See, his perspective on life, even late in the game, his perspective on life had been utterly changed. And when he finally passed, he went, he was completely ready to go. You know, there's a lot of confusion in the world today, and people are concerned about to everything from politics to economics to things going on in society, fighting over this, fighting over that. <clears throat> And the more you listen to the news, it just gets worse. It just makes you that much more depressed. But then I think about the early church. I think about the the first couple hundred years as the church grew and was formed. And that church was born in the midst of conflict, much like our own. I mean, in some areas of the world, Christians were merely ostracized. With other areas like Rome, they were thrown to the lions. That's pretty bad. Um, What was it about that early church that set them apart? What gave them the courage to face such tremendous hardships in life? What they discovered and what Paul hits on this morning is that in light of the grace of Jesus Christ and in light of the hope of eternity, in light of these things, we can find true peace and joy in the midst of the muck and the mess of everyday life. And so when Paul says, for me, living is Christ and dying is gain, What he's talking about is seeing life in entirely new and different perspective than the rest of the world. Now, along the lines that there's only two kinds of people in the world, you've heard me say that enough, there are also two very different and distinct perspectives on life on this earth. Now, last week we talked about how it's good to have different perspectives in the church and how it helps us grow. But this is, now I'm talking about something different here. I'm talking about the difference between the world's point of view of life and a Christian's point of view or perspective on what life is about on earth. And we saw this as we went through the book of Romans. We saw this contract, uh, contrast in Romans 8.5, sums, sums it up the best. We read this a while back. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live, live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. It's the difference between living your best life now and being able to say, like Paul, that dying is actually gain. Paul Paul can only say this because he was utterly convinced of the gospel. He had placed his hope 
in God's promises, the same promises that had been given out over centuries, millennia, that God had shared to his people through history. And he believed that the end of this life was actually just the beginning. See, for the Christian, death is no longer the final word on existence. And in fact, according to Paul, it's light years beyond that. Because not only does he say dying is gain, he says living. He says, for me, living is Christ. See, coming to know Christ is really the only true way that we can find value in this life. It's only the biblical story of redemption that makes any sense out of the muck of humanity. And when we realize that there's hope beyond, that there's hope beyond the pain and the brokenness of this life, it's just the suffering that Paul faced and that the suffering that we face, life doesn't become, it's no longer that scary, really. See, elsewhere, people must fight and scrape to survive. Because if death is the end, then it makes sense that in this life, you do everything and get everything you can out of it. A, a, an old preacher once said, you get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. I mean, knowing that there's this whole eternity that's laid out before us makes the losses and the sacrifices of this life just that much, bear, that much more bearable. And it helps us to release those things that we hold on so tightly to. And see, this is what Paul is getting at. So Paul is writing this letter from prison. Don't know which prison sentence he's in right now. It's probably not Rome. Could have been in Ephesus. We're not sure. But he's writing this letter from, from prison. And in Philippi, there's a little bit of controversy over this. So this is the other thing that's going on in this letter. Here's the man who led them to Christ. Here's the, the father of their community. And he's now a criminal condemned by Rome. And this is not what the Christian life is supposed to look like. Surely this super apostle shouldn't be locked up for faith. I mean, surely he should not be chained. If he really was God's man, wouldn't God get him out of prison? And more than that, does Paul being in prison mean that we might end up in prison ourselves? See, this is what they were fighting over. See, there were those even then who believed that this was your best life now. Christianity is supposed to make all things better, isn't it? And Paul says, no way. No. He boasts in his privilege to suffer for Christ. And he encourages them in their suffering to see it as a privilege as well. See, in most places back then, actually coming out as a Christian was a huge risk. I mean, in some cases, you would just be ostracized by your community. I mean, with everybody else marching up to the Temple Diana to party, you were stuck at home. You weren't playing those games that they were playing anymore. And Jews, Jews who came to belief... They lost, in many cases, their entire family. They were thrown out of their synagogues. They, they, they lost their entire social system. But see, for Paul, none of that mattered because he was able to hold suffering in perspective. He was able to take that and hold that intention with the cross of Christ, with the grace, and with the promise of eternity. Living, dying, it's all the same. And this is what he 
He encourages them to change their view about this life, to change their perspective. Whether you're in the in crowd or pariah to society, you can still boast in Christ and the faith that He has granted you. Paul says that it is Christ who has granted you both the privilege to believe in Him and the privilege to suffer for Him. So uh, evidently this, this confusion at Philippi led to some conflict in the church. And again, here, like other places that we've read, Paul has to deal with the lack of unity. There were confusions and arguments over whether they should follow Paul anymore, let alone whether or not this life should have been full of hardship. And all this led to division. And his answer to this confusion was to bolster their faith in Christ. He encourages them to keep the main thing the main thing. Don't get distracted by the crud of this life. And especially, don't let hardships come between you and your fellow believers. This is the same thing that we've been seeing over the last several weeks, isn't it? It's unity. God's repeated call is to unity. Because whether it's opinions or confusion or straight up sinfulness, the body of Christ must move beyond and stick together. Paul calls on them to live life in a manner worthy of the gospel. And what he's not saying here is that it's up to you to build up, to screw up, to, build, to, to brace up the, your faith. Faith is not some energy that we're supposed to appropriate. Again, faith has been bestowed. It is our privilege. God has granted us faith. See, life, living a life worthy of the gospel in this text is, just like before, living the law of love. It's treating each other with love and humility despite the confusion, despite the suffering, despite differing opinions, despite sin. That's why he says, he encourages them to stand firm in one spirit. He's speaking out against their conflict. Stand firm in one spirit in the face of the storms of life. It's striving side by side with one mind. He's talking about unity despite not having all the answers. And it's definitely walking together in suffering. There's all, there's got to be nothing worse, maybe almost nothing worse than suffering alone. I mean, probably the biggest tragedy of this season of the coronavirus is the simple fact that so many people have had to face their mortality alone. It's awful. People have struggled and died while in quarantine without any loved ones whatsoever. I couldn't even get into the hospital, and I tried. Isolation has taken its toll on people this year. Addiction rates, suicide have all risen drastically over the last six months. Why? Because we are creatures designed to live in community. And when things get bad, like what's going on at the Church of Philippi, when things get bad, we need each other the most. It's, it's fascinating that in our weakest, in our most broken times as human beings, when things get really bad, do you realize that that's when we are most apt to withdraw? We are most apt to pull away when it all hits the fan. Paul says... 
when things are at their worst. First, there's two things he says in this text. When things are at their worst, first, keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the gospel and God's promises ever before her, your eyes. Remember that the faith comes from him, not from you. This is what he's telling the church. And that in the end, dying is gain. Life is not the end. This life is not the end. It is only the beginning. That's the encouragement that he gives them. And then the second thing he says is, don't let the hardships and the confusions divide. Don't let them divide you. Don't let them divide us. Stand firm in Christ and in one spirit with each other. Strive side by side. Don't strive alone. That's what he's saying. Don't strive alone. We strive together in our one mind, our own perspective. Now, within the church, these perspectives, our own perspective on life isn't enough. This is why we need to come together and share our different perspectives on faith and how God has encouraged each one of us. These times is when we come together and just simply submit to each other and care for each other. Because even when things are tough, what we need is, what we need most is to be of one mind, striving together with each other as fellow believers. All this plays out in how we treat each other and how we treat others. When we become convinced that we have something to look forward to, when we become convinced that there's somebody in control of this life, when we become convinced that that person is God, then we can lay ourselves aside for the sake of others. And it's important here, because Paul is saying this too to Philippi, it's important that we must not succumb to the world's despair. We must not succumb to the world's perspective on existence. We must not buy into this notion that death is the end. Because not only is it not true, we begin to reflect what the world believes. And what we're called to do is reflect hope, is to reflect the gospel, to shine God's light. And, and, and the thing is, we're the only ones, we're the only ones that have that light in this life. You realize that? If there is no other hope for the world other than the gospel of Christ, any ways that our lives shine that gospel shines light into despair. It's, it's not just truth into error. That's true. But when, when grace and hope plays out in our life, it brings grace and hope to others, and it shines hope into the despair of this world. It's hope for our own brokenness, and it's hope for the many people out there who really are searching for the truth, that really are searching for hope and for life, for real life, for true life, life that can only come by being united in Christ. Amen. Would you please stand as we respond with the hymn on page six of your bulletin?
And now we have the opportunity to confess that which we believe about this great faith of ours as found in the Nicene Creed on page 6 of your bulletin. Let us recite together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Prayers of the People, Form 3, is found on page 7 of your bulletin or in the Book of Common Prayer on page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, Gregory Brewer, our bishop, Father Rob, our rector, the province of the Episcopal Church of South Sudan, and Bishop Justin Badi Arama, Christ the King Church, Lakeland, and Reverend Carolyn Biggs, St. Stephen's Church, Lakeland, and the Reverend David Peoples, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your words and sacraments. We pray for President Donald Trump, Governor Ron DeSantis, Mayor Brian Nelson, and for all those who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, may be delivered from their distress. Give to the parted, the departed, especially Marie Putnam, eternal rest, that light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Gracious God, we do lift up our hearts to you this morning. Um, I pray that you would each day convince us more and more of your grace. Remind us of the hope that we have in glory and remind us that you have won the battle for us in this life and in the next. We pray that your, your light would shine through us into this neighborhood, this city, and the world. 
Lord, your gospel, that your gospel may go forth and change lives. We thank you that through your gospel comes peace, not just to us, but to all who come to you, and we pray that many would. Lord, we pray for our church, that you would grant us greater peace day after day, that you would unite us, our hearts together more and more, that you would cause us to grow and have the resources to reach out and proclaim your word. Lord, would you bless us um, as we come to you? And then for those who, um, whose hearts have been hurt, for those who have left your church, for those who have walked away. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for your children who have been hurt. Lord, we pray that you would comfort their souls and give them peace and call them back into your fold. And then, Father, we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you. My own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Would you stand, please? May God's eternal peace, may the truth of the gospel and the peace that that bestows on us in this life, May that peace come upon you and rest upon you. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Amen. Uh, We're going to take a moment, pass the peace, give everybody the high sign, show some love from afar as best you can, elbow bumps, all of that stuff. We're still practicing social distancing. Thank you. One of these days, we'll get beyond it, but it's not today. Uh, We're going to take a moment, wash up for Eucharist, and we'll come back with announcements.
Now it's on. Good morning and welcome. It is so good to be with you this morning in the house of the Lord. It's good to share um, in worship, in song, and in a moment in the table. Uh, I want to say welcome to anybody who's visiting us, especially online. Thank you so much um, for being with us. If this is your first time, boys, if this is... Uh, so, Mom, if you want, you can throw an elbow and take them both out. It's okay. Um, if, if, I'm, uh, um, if this is, sorry, if this is your first time, um, thank you. Thank you for joining us. If you would drop a comment in the, the comment screen there on Facebook, we would love to just hear from you. Uh, if you've got a question about the ministry here um, at, at Holy Spirit Church, drop, drop me a line. Um, private message or just leave it there in the comment section. But thank you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, we start this, our service, or this part of our service, by celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. And so, do we have any birthdays, first of all? We do. Everybody turn around and say, hi, Mike. Um, just want to say, so you all knew who we were praying for. Um, Mike's birthday is... Is this coming Friday or last Friday? No, this coming Friday. So Mike's uh, uh, having a birthday soon, and so we're going to go ahead and pray for him. Would you please join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your servant. We thank you for the life that you have given him, for the years of ups and downs and the ways that you have molded him into uh, the man of God that he is, we pray that you would bless him abundantly this year, that this would be a big year for him, um, that it would be his best year so far, and that he would find deeper grace um, coming from you, and that um, you would lead and guide his steps. We thank you so much um, for what you're doing in him, and ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we have any anniversaries, uh, anniversaries to celebrate? No? And the last but not least, is travel. Anybody traveling? My mask is all funky. Uh, nobody traveling. Okay. Um, so y'all are, y'all are old timers, so we don't have to talk about how we're doing um, the Eucharist. Uh, one of these days, we're going to, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> I meant the COVID stuff. Um, so uh, as far as Eucharist and dismissal, you all know how that's, um, that's going to be happening. Thank you for continuing with the social distancing. I really honestly believe that things are going to relax again here pretty soon. Um, one thing I do want to announce that I didn't throw in here is just to kind of have you looking forward, uh, but in the near future, not to glory quite yet. But, um, and that is, you know... Uh, a while back, the diocese gave permission to start opening up for things like coffee hour and such. Um, and when that happened, we, we made sure and say, okay, hold on, don't get all excited, because there are a few things that we needed to work out first. I just want to let you know that, that we're, we're making plans. Um, we're getting some things polished up over in the parish hall. We had a project going on over there. That's starting to come together. So just know that, you know, we're not avoiding that social time. We need that social time, um, but wanted to let you know that we're moving forward on that. And so no announcements yet as, as to when it's going to be our grand reopening or whatever, um, but that'll be coming in the not too distant future. And then the last thing uh, that I just want to remember, wanted, wanted to remind you of is um, opportunities to give. Thank you for supporting the ministries here at Church of the Holy Spirit. Remember that you can give online at give.holyspiritapaca.com. Um, you can text to give, or you can just mail in a check. So um, online, if you want the, the information to text, just drop a question and we'll post it for you. But please do um, support the, the ministries here. There's a lot going on, and we have a lot of plans for our future. So uh, thank you for supporting those plans. And now our offertory sentence for this morning comes from the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. Paul says, I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Before we begin, I remind us that what we stand before is the Lord's table. Um, it's not the church's table, it's not my table. This belongs to the Lord. It is Christ offering himself to us. And as such, if you're a baptized member in any Christian church, you are welcome here. If you're local, this is your first time um, uh, visiting us online. We do a drive through Eucharist at 11 a.m., so right after this service where you can come down to the church at 601 South Highland and come through the parking lot up to the front of the church, and we will serve you Eucharist um, from this table. We would love for you to join us. Please come. Would you please stand? The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Please kneel as you are able. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts through faith and with thanksgiving.
Our post-communion prayer can be found on page 365 of the Book of Common Prayer and on page 13 of your bulletins. Would you pray with me? Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now would you stand with me? Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And now let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia! Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. And as you hear, it's, I think it's raining pretty hard right now, so don't go rushing out the door too fast, I guess. Uh, you might be swimming unless you have to leave right away, but um, if you stick around in the sanctuary, remember, keep your social distancing. But uh, enjoy your day. Have a blessed one. Oh, and a quick reminder. I just remember, for those who are doing Ultrea tonight, 7 o'clock, you should have a link in your email to the Zoom. All right.
See 